Psalm 37, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 37, 1 through 6. I like the sound of the pages flipping. It's the sound of church. Yep. Psalm 37, verses 1 through 6 is what we're going to be looking at this morning. Right, y'all look a little sleepy. Turkey still in your system? I've had a few days to burn it off. Come on. Psalm 37, 1 through 6. Allow me to read that for you. David, he writes, Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong. For they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like noonday. Let's pray together. We are grateful. We are a happy people. We have been purchased by the blood of you, Jesus Christ. That in your blood we have atonement, we have forgiveness of sins, we have reconciliation. In Jesus Christ, you defeated the grave. They tried to stop you, they tried to bury you, they crucified you. But death cannot hold you. There is no force in all creation that can hold you down, that can steady your hand. Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Spirit, guide us at this time as we look at this word. May it stir our hearts. Let it correct our minds. And I pray that it glorifies the Father. That this preaching event is for your good pleasure is for your happiness, and when you are happy, we are happy. We reap in the blessings you've given us. We want to walk in the light. Protect us from evil. Let us strive and press towards the prize. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. How are you liking this windy weather this morning? How many is liking this cold weather? I do. I love the cold weather. It gives me all the reasons I can to wear a cardigan. I like sweater vests. I like cardigans. I like all the wardrobe that goes to this time of year. I like cozying up inside. And I like chili. Okay? Now I'm going to introduce a little controversy here. Okay? By show of hands, who believes noodles belong in chili? Spaghetti, yeah, macaroni. Keep them up, be brave, stand by your position. Pro noodles, raise your hands. Who thinks that's a complete abomination? All right, okay. Not neatly down the middle. It seems like the abomination crowd <laughs> is leading the way. Well, a lot of people like certain things in their chili. They like cheese. They like crackers. I'm going to throw one at you. My favorite thing to put in chili is peanut butter. All right? Now, everybody sits there and goes, oh, that's disgusting. But then they want a peanut butter sandwich on the side. I don't get it. But a lot of people, when they hear that, they're like, those two don't belong together. Keep those things separated. Put a wall between the chili and the peanut butter. They don't belong together. But I argue that they do. Don't knock it until you try it. And so the next time you make some peanut butter, just, just a little spoonful, just a little flop, stir it around, make it where it's super thick that it, you could do the blizzard thing like at Dairy Queen when they hold it upside down. Try it, and you will love it. The two do belong to one another. Now this morning, <laughs> wow, very vocal, very vocal. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Nita. Now this morning's message is Thanksgiving. And you might be like, well, Thanksgiving's over. 
That was last Thursday. Don't you remember eating all that food last Thursday and sleeping Friday away? I do remember Thursday. I don't remember much of Friday because I snoozed the rest of the day. And there's a lot of debate in our culture about things that don't belong mixed up together. Thanksgiving, Christmas, keep them separate, right? What are you doing the Sunday after Thanksgiving talking about Thanksgiving? Shouldn't you be talking about Christmas? Well, I would argue that the theme of Thanksgiving is just that, being thankful. And Christmas is a message of hope. Thanksgiving and hope go together. Christmas and Thanksgiving go together. Chili and peanut butter go together. And so we are going to be talking about Thanksgiving this morning as we transition, segue into the holiday season. And I want to talk about Thanksgiving and being hopeful. And when it talks about in Psalm 37, when we face the temptation of being envious of evildoers, we fail to be thankful. That's what coveting is, right? Coveting when you are envious of someone else, particularly evil doers, you fail to be thankful. And so instead of coveting, we should put our trust, our gratitude, and our hope in God. And so what we're going to do is in these first two verses, we're going to look at a, a thankless and hopeless lot, the thankless and hopeless, that these are individuals who do not have gratitude, that they do not enjoy the Lord and therefore are without hope. And then verses 3 through 6, we're going to look at the complete opposite, the thankful and hopeful. And, and this is a theme that you see a great deal in the book of Psalms, comparing and contrasting the wicked with the righteous. And what we see here is the wicked individuals, well, they seem to go unchecked. They seem to live life without any type of concern at all. And that seems to strike the singer odd. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. Whether or not they have good reason to be thankful. So let's look at the thankless and hopeless and then the thankful and hopeful. Colossians 1.27. I want you to remember this verse. It might better fit later in the sermon. But I want it to be kind of the theme. All right? So I want us to be in our mind throughout the sermon and recall it when we come to the end. Colossians 1.27. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Remember that. Now, J.I. Packer, he says this about hope. There is hope. For a ruined humanity, hope of pardon, hope of peace with God, hope of glory. Because the Father's will, Jesus Christ became poor and was born in a stable so that 30 years later he might hang on a cross. And so what we see in these quotes and these verses is a glimpse of what we should be thankful for and hopeful for. Again, this all ties in together. Even I made a hint towards Easter. There is a theme here of being thankful and hope-filled, and we have reasons to do so. But let's talk about that first group, the evildoers, the wicked, the thankless and hopeless. Let's look at verses 1 through 2 one more time. David writes... Do not, do not be agitated by evil doers. Do not envy those who do wrong. For they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. So the wicked here, the evil doers, I would describe as thankless and hopeless. And I hate to acknowledge this. But there is a genuine temptation to be envious of evildoers. Or otherwise, the Bible wouldn't even address it at all. If it wasn't a real problem, the Bible would not have brought it up. In our weakness, sometimes we look at evildoers, we look at wicked people, and we want what they have. And David addresses this. 
See, the singer, the person who is taking the song and singing it to the Lord, is to refrain from being agitated by the lifestyle of the wicked. Now, what does that word agitated mean in the Hebrew? It means to be heated or to be hot in anger. Don't be so mad about the situation that you are facing. What is there to be agitated about? Well, simply this. One can look at the world and testify and say and, and testify that evil people seemingly are better off. Have you ever felt that way? That you've looked at people who are behaved maybe powerful, rich, celebrities, that they seem to have a life of ease, or wicked people doing terrible things, and they seem to go unchecked. That they have everything easy and given to them on a silver platter. They have wealth. They have pleasure. And so when we observe, when we look at people like that, we kind of sit there and say, well, that's not fair. Why do they who are evil seem to be blessed by the Lord? Now, Ecclesiastes, the author also struggled with this as well. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1, the teacher writes this, Again, I observed all the acts of oppression being done under the sun. Look at the tears of those who are oppressed. They have no one to comfort them. Power is with those who oppress them. They have no one to comfort them. And so this, this teacher who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes talking about the vanity of life, the struggle of life, things that he's just observing, he's thinking out loud. He seems like this doesn't make sense. It seems like power is with the oppressor and that those who are being oppressed have nobody. That does not seem right. And therefore, the temptation to be envious, because if you're sitting there saying, if all this evil injustice continues to go unaddressed, that if the big guys are constantly harassing the little guys and take whatever they want, why serve the Lord if wickedness brings pleasure? That's, that's a real temptation. Why forego all these pleasures, the opportunity to take advantage of other people if nothing bad happens to you? If the Lord is just going to ignore it. And so you see what they are facing. And this is something that happens quite a bit. Oftentimes we look in the Bible that this command of not being envious of the evildoers comes up. I'm going to share four of them. Four. Now, I want you to think about that. Because, again, we sit there and say, oh, I'm not envious of evildoers. You know, I, I'm not this way. I don't get the temptation you're talking about. I would argue that the Bible is so concerned about it that it comes up often. Look at Proverbs 24, 19. Don't be agitated by evildoers and don't envy the wicked. There it is in Proverbs 3, 31. Same thing. Don't envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. Proverbs 23, 17. Don't let your heart envy sinners. Instead, always fear the Lord. Proverbs 24, 1 through 2. Don't envy the evil or desire to be with them for their hearts play in violence and their words stir up trouble. And so again, if you're out here saying this isn't a real temptation, this isn't a real danger, this isn't a real concern, why are you even bringing it up? I would reply, why does the Bible bring it up so often? If it is not a real concern. Because we do look at people on TV. We do look at people who get off the hook. We do look at people who are just living pleasure and pleasure and are adored by other people. We sit there and go, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. Why can't I be that way? There seems to be no reward in the Lord. 
And so we hear this over and over again. Don't be agitated. Don't envy. Don't let your heart envy sinners. Don't envy the evil or desire to be with them. This is, however, easier said than done. But David does assure God that God is not, excuse me, assuring his audience that God is not ignoring the wicked. The deeds of evildoers are not overlooked. See, we tend to be impatient. That's the problem. We tend to be impatient and don't understand that God is patient with unbelievers, that he is patient with sinners because he desires all people to be saved. And so justice seems like It's coming at a snail's pace, but I assure you, every evil deed will be held accounted for. That everybody will be responsible for what they have done. And then what we also see is that evildoers, just like the rest of us, have brief lives. And that this life, in comparison to eternity... Is nothing. It's simple and small and short. So much so that he compares it to, well, grass. They wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. But that, that's not the case with the righteous, is it? Per Psalm 1. Right? They're like a tree planted beside stir, uh, steel waters where they are properly nourished and they give fruit in the proper time. But wicked people, not so. See, we're all, everyone here is going to die. Everyone. Some will be for a while. Some may be soon. I don't know. But this is what's true of both the wicked and the righteous. Life is fleeting. Life is short, especially in comparison to eternity. So the wicked are a thankless lot. And are not to be imitated. They are nothing more than a fruitless garden that has been devastated by the summer heat. We got several gardeners in here. We know what that's like. I know what it's like to go out there and try to reap up the potatoes, but then some mold came along and ate them all. We know what it's like when it's like 105 degree weather. It doesn't matter how much you water your garden, how much you try. It's just not going to bear fruit. This is the wicked. They are like a wasteland. And so there is no hope for them and the life to come and will face divine judgment. That is something that they do not have hope in is an eternal bliss with the Lord. And so therefore they are thankless and hopeless. They don't care about this life. They don't care about what they do, who they harm, and they don't show gratitude and appreciation to the Lord. Now, oftentimes... People don't like to hear about hope. We like to fixate on the negative. We really do. And we don't like the guy who stands up in the midst of pain and despair and speak of hope. But I believe this with my whole heart. Hope doesn't exist unless there is despair and pain. You understand that. The only way that you can have hope is when things are not going well. When things are going perfectly, what is there to hope for? The virtue of hope only can exist in terrible times. G.K. Chesterton puts it this way. Hope means hoping when things are hopeless, or it is no virtue at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, hope is mere flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. You understand that? Hope is what we need when it's dark. Hope is what we need when it's painful. They do not have hope. To live a life just for pleasure, to live a life just for self, it's not a life that you should be envious of. Because they too, like us, will go to the ground. And they too, like us, will meet God. It all depends on what terms we meet him. Whether or not we have hope. 
So do not be envious of them. Don't go down into despair because once you are in despair, you fail to have gratitude and thankfulness and thankfulness. You know, uh, I believe I shared this story already. But uh, when I went to uh, the Brown Cancer Center just the other day, I was there to meet with my doctor to discuss my results. And I didn't have the good news yet. And so I was sitting in the waiting room, pretty anxious, pretty upset, in a bad mood. Okay? Then they called me back. And every time, you know how this works, before you go see the doctor, they have you do your weight, check your blood pressure, oxygen level, take your uh, temperature. And it was especially crowded that day. And so I was required to sit in a room filled with other patients. And so we were all in our chairs by ourselves. And like I said, I wasn't in a good mood. I wasn't in a talkative mood. I didn't want to be bothered. But then the guy to my left, and I didn't really look at him when I sat down, he said, you ever get tired of people asking what happened to your head? I get asked that ever so often. And I didn't want to hear it. I was not in the mood to explain my insecurities to a stranger. And I was very tempted to say something to him. But I turned my head and I looked at him and this man had a big smile on his face. And his entire eye socket was gone. Completely gone. I mean, he wasn't missing an eye. He was. But he was missing an eye, an eyelid, eyebrow. It looked like there was just a portion of his skull looking at me. And he had the biggest smile on his face. Because I knew why he asked the question. Do you get tired of people asking about that scar on your head? Because I get tired of being asked about my eye. And I remember we got to chatting with each other talking with one another, so much so my blood pressure just went through the roof and the nurse told us to stop talking. That's how chatty we were. And I remember when it was my time, it only took a few seconds being in there, I walked out and I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm glad I didn't lose an eye. And then I remember sitting there thinking, well, I'm glad I didn't lose a leg because I knew a man back in North Carolina who did the melanoma. And then perspective kicked in, folks. And then with proper perspective came gratitude. And then from gratitude, thankfulness. I know pain is annoying. Pain hurts. We we hate seeing sin. We hate seeing the curse seemingly prevail. But we are to be a thankful and hopeful people. Let's look at verses 3 through 6. That's where we're going. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Thankful and hopeful when we are unable to understand this paradox of prevailing evil. David instructs us to trust in the Lord. This is all we can do when our reasoning abilities fail us, when we just can't make sense of things. And we are told elsewhere, in fact, this is the memory verse, Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. So like stated before, this is a a prescriptive psalm. This is a psalm telling you what to do. And the singers are commanded to follow through with several actions. Let's talk about the action roles of man. What what is man supposed to do according to this text? Well, trust in the Lord. Do what is good. Dwell in the land securely. Delight in the Lord or be happy in the Lord. You understand, to be happy in the Lord is a command. Right? Right? Because a lot of times people see obeying the Lord means foregoing pleasure. Obeying the Lord means, well, I'm going to follow the Lord, which means sadness. But the command is to delight in the Lord. 
that God wants, nay, commands it for you to be happy, to be happy in him. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. Trust in the Lord ends with trust in him. Do what is good, dwell in the land securely. Delight in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord. In response to this, this is what God does in response when his people behave in such a manner. It says he will give you your heart's desire. Now let's understand that properly. It doesn't mean he gives you everything that you want. He's talking about a heart that's aligned with his will. That kind of heart gets what he wants. A heart that's in love with the Lord, a heart that wants the same thing that God wants, will get it. And so the question is, what does your heart really want? And to align it with the Lord's. It says, he will act. He will act. Now think about that. Three simple words. That if you are someone who trusts in the Lord, does what is good, if you are the nation of Israel who decides to dwell in the land securely, delights in the Lord, commits your way to the Lord, trusts in Him, He will act. Now that's, that's, that's a big deal. That God says, this is what prompts me to move. This is what kind of attitude, what kind of spirit that I honor. This is what prompts me to move. And we often pray, we say, I say in my prayer, Holy Spirit, move. Move among us. God, move and do great things. Well, trust in him. And then he will act. And how so? Well, get specific. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. And so when, all, when mankind, the people of God, do these things, God honors it. And he moves. And he makes your righteousness shine like the dawn. Your justice like the noonday. So what we see in here is that there is both a limited and present glory and complete and future glory of the believer. Let me say that again. There is both a limited present day glory of the believer and there is also a complete promised future glory of the believer. What do I mean by a limited present day glory? Well, Jesus speaks of the church being the light of the world and her radiating her good works before man. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. That's glorious. So glorious, Jesus describes himself as the light of the world. That is a title that he shares with his people. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lamp stand. And it gives light for all who are in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. See, light in the Bible usually is descriptive of several things. Sometimes revelation, I can see by the light. But then oftentimes it talks about the glory of things. See, the church, the body of Christ, is presently glorious. Because we are his people here on earth and he resides among us. In the same way, the spirit of God was on the temple and there was a Shekinah glory. The spirit of God is in the church and there is a glory. There is to be something glorious about us. But in this same passage, Jesus says there is the possibility of your glory being hidden by decisions you make. By beliefs you hold to. By actions that you perform. That, you could put your light, your glory, under a basket. But you ought not to do that. Because your good works are a means of evangelism. Think about that. Your good works perform, perform people is a way that you can manifest your glory and people in return glorify God. Yeah. 
good works and love is a great evangelistic way. And so it's so important to have this light shining and that we understand that we have a present day glory. But what about our complete future glory? That is in reference to our glorious final state in our resurrected bodies in a restored creation. True, it seems that the wicked have a temporary victory. It is even true that the righteous suffer. But we remain thankful. We remain hopeful. Why? Because of this hope. Romans 8.18 For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. See this future glory that is on the horizon? See in Psalms he's touching on this. Making your righteousness shine like the dawn. Your justice like the noonday. Glory. If you trust in the Lord, do what is good. If you have faith in the Son, Jesus Christ, you will have a present day limited glory in anticipation of a permanent future glory. Going back to Colossians, remember that? God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What? What is your hope to have any type of glory in the final judgment? Christ in you. Because of that promise of all the people on God's green earth, we should be above everyone else the most thankful and hope-filled people ever. But sadly... We are the gloomiest, snarkiest, most depressing people. Praise God from the altar. Touchdown! Hugging strangers at a stadium. Touchdown! Did you see that? Get to church. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> Kid you not. And I have a, an, an explanation as to why we're like this. I watched an interview of a musician. This particular musician, very rich, very well known. And he was being interviewed. And they asked him the question. They said, do you think fame and fortune has changed you at all? And he goes, well, I don't know. And they're like, well, how much are you worth? And he goes, I don't know. I actually had to call my manager the other day and ask him if I had enough money to buy this watch. And the guy was like, well, how much did the watch cost? He's like, "Eh, about a hundred bucks. And he looked at the musicians like, wait a minute. You have sold millions of records. You are the top musician in your genre. You are worldwide known. You sell out at every concert venue. And you had no idea that you could afford a $100 watch? And the guy genuinely was like, "Mm, I didn't know. See, he didn't know how rich he was. This guy, it was incredible that this guy failed to realize how rich he was. Churches are filled with Christians who fail to realize how rich they are. What you have in Christ. Christ in you. The hope of glory. See, when we know what God has in store for us, this glorious light shining like the new day sun, how could we be so quiet about it? So gloomy about it. Hopeless. And thankless. Cannot. Cannot. We should have joy overflowing from our hearts. That we are delighting in the Lord. And when we trust in him. When we obey him. He will move. He will act. 
Isn't that what we want here at First Baptist Church? That when we want the activity of God, the movement of God, then you should become a thankful and hope-filled people. Why is our faith so stale? Because we don't know how rich we are. Why is our thanksgiving so weak? Because we truly do not know what has been given to us. Our musicians are going to help us out at this time. I argue that it's now time to have a change of attitude. A change of understanding. Use this time to come to the altar. Express gratitude to God. That you're able to get up, breathe, have breakfast. That you have friends and family. You have eternal life in Jesus Christ. The Son of God who is given to us. A great gift. Come to the altar and express your gratitude to God. Pray with me. Pray with each other. Respond to God's word. All right.